Hello, my guest today is Dr. Cameron Nalen from the Public Library of Science. Dr. Nalen is a biophysicist, an advocate of open access, open research and improved data management. He has rich interdisciplinary experience in scientific research. Dr. Nalen is also the advocacy director at the Public Library of Science. As a respected leader in the open access movement, he often participates in legislative and policy initiatives around the world. Dr. Nalen, welcome and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, is open access suitable for everyone? Does it matter where scientists at the early stage of their academic careers publish their articles? Uh, or maybe it makes no difference if it is open access journal instead of tall access one. What's your opinion about it? So for me, open access is for everyone in the sense that it's intended to be for everyone. For early career researchers, they often have concerns about how their career is going to progress, whether they can get a permanent job once they have a permanent job, whether they can raise the money uh, to do that research. And in the past, it, it may have been the case that taking non-traditional approaches wasn't the best way to get ahead, or at least wasn't the way they were told was the best way to get ahead. But we're increasingly moving towards a world where, for any researcher, the crucial thing is to show how your work has made a difference, who it has made a difference to, and for that to be broader than just your effect on the research community. We have evidence that even in the case of the research community, increasing access increases the chances of your work being used. Obviously, making it available to more people in the general public makes it more likely it will be used. So while perhaps in the past it's been the case that it at least didn't feel like it was in people's best interests, I think we're rapidly moving to a world where researchers really need, at all levels, to show that their work is, is making a difference. And one of the ways to ensure that they maximise the chances of that is through choosing a, an approach to open access which ensures that, that work is available. Thank you. Uh, you often suggest that open access should not be perceived separately beyond the context of other mechanisms of open science. Uh, to put it in other words, I would say that gratis open access uh, is not the ultimate solution, one can say. To complete the opening of science, we must enable people to openly reuse the papers and data. Uh, Allowing reuse seems to be a natural part of open science. Could you please elaborate on that a little bit? So when open access was first defined um, in the Budapest Open Access Initiative um, in 2002-2003, it really focused on two issues. One was the ability to be able to freely access, to read um, scholarly work. But the other thing that was really important even in that very initial declaration was that notion of reuse and for me it's it's a remarkably forward-looking um, statement because many aspects of that still are very true for us today you wouldn't want to create a world in which people can look but not touch research is ultimately there to be used and it can be used by other researchers it can be used by educators, it can be used by professionals in, in health or by lay people interested in their environment or their health or, or other issues that matter to them. To enable that to happen, we need people to be able to discover and come across that work. So it's more than just making it available to, to read. To make it actually usable and useful which is, again, the ultimate aim of research, is to be useful in some sense. Um, it's critically important that we enable people to use that. And that might mean simple things like collecting a variety of articles together for a group that means something to them. It might mean translating those articles into another language or passing them up into a book and printing it and distributing it to perhaps places where the internet doesn't reach. It might be using it for commercial innovation. It might be using it for not-for-profit innovation. But all of those things which maximise the, the value of what we create, this common good that we create through scholarship, and, and whether it's publicly funded or, or commercially funded in some cases, there are many cases where maximising that common good is best served 
by making it freely available, freely reusable, and not just freely reusable, but actually used. Yeah. And that's ultimately where we need to go. Uh, my next question would be about the beneficial effect of open reuse of scientific results. Uh, I think that your approach to this issue is somehow similar to the one of Michael Nielsen. Uh, his vision, which he presented in his 2011 book uh, entitled Reinventing Discovery, uh, he seems to believe that the real open science would allow more efficient and more effective uh, reuse because of something he calls micro-expertise potential. And I think this idea might seem a little too idealistic to me. Uh, the possible concern about it is that although it seems obviously liberating, it could also be somehow dangerous. What I mean, skeptics might suggest that not everybody would be equally eager to, to participate in this kind of undertaking. And as a result, those who are reluctant to share their data or papers uh, could easily access the content shared by supporters of openness. And that seems a little unfair. What do you think? So I think there's two questions wrapped up there. One is about the effectiveness of making research outputs. And I think we're no longer just talking about research articles, but also data, material, software, yes. all of these things. The, the effectiveness of making them available. Um, and we have some good evidence emerging on that. Uh, PLOS, along with the Wellcome Trust and Google, funded a program last year called the Accelerating Science Award Program where we awarded three prizes of $30,000 each to people who reused open access research. And this included open access data, elements of open access articles. Um, and we had many, many submissions from all sorts of countries from people who had you know, reused research. There's interesting evidence about the, the difference in the economic benefits that arose from the open human genome project and the commercial human genome project, the fact that the economic impact of that open human genome project, that put data in the public domain for anyone to use, actually created 30% more economic impact as a result of that openness. So we have good evidence and emerging evidence, both anecdotally and, and, and quantitative, that this is making a difference in, in specific cases. Um, but there is that bigger question you ask about incentives. Is there the potential for uh, freeloaders to take advantage of those who are, who are um, making these research yeah. outputs freely available? And that's really at the core of what makes this difficult for some researchers to, to make that jump. They feel that by giving things away that they may lose the advantage they have of holding things close to their chest. Of course, this is why we publish research. No one would ever publish research and then say, oh, but I don't want anyone to use it. So it's just that we've got this system that focuses on publication, the, the publication of research in journals, as opposed to rewarding other forms of sharing. What is interesting to me is to think about a reward and incentive system where people are rewarded, celebrated, for the fact that their work is being used, rather than for the fact that they've necessarily published an article. We're seeing changes in this direction already. It's no longer enough to put in a CV um, and simply put the names of the journals you're published in. People expect to know how many times those articles have been cited, how many times they've been used by other scholars. It's not a big leap from there to say, I will also put a data set on my CV, and I will put next to that data set the fact that it's been used and cited a hundred times, a thousand times, that it's been downloaded 20,000 times, that it influenced the creation of, of other, uh, other data sets, of other articles. There's an interesting story just, just for me in the last couple of days, a piece of software that I wrote when I was just learning to program four or five years ago, um, and someone emailed me to say, could they use this software? Um, it was open source, they were freely allowed to use it, but they felt it really important to ask me about whether I was happy with that, to give me the credit for doing that. And I think one of the things we keep forgetting is that researchers 
and the research community is very serious about assigning credit for work. We worry mostly that people won't give that credit, yet actually we're very good at doing it. What we might need to do is to be a bit better at measuring that credit and of using that more effectively in the way that we assess different research, different researchers uh, in the future. But I do believe that we can create the incentives where the competition will be about how effectively we share. Because that's, I think, one of the more exciting things that enables the creation of the kind of word, world that Michael was talking about, where many people, most of whom we've never heard of or thought of, have the opportunity to bring their expertise to, to solving our problems. And we have the opportunity to engage with other people who are interested in the same problems that we are. Uh, how can the effective measurement of data reuse uh, be done? You know, what tools do we need? Uh, could you say something about it? So the first step we need Jason Prem, who's one of the leaders in, in what's called the altmetrics movement, the, the, the movement to look at new ways of measuring new kinds of outputs, makes a really important point, which is that the steps we want to take are one at a time. So first we should look at traditional measures of non-traditional outputs, so citations, probably from the, the journal literature, to data sets or to software. Let's create the opportunity for citations from those traditional sources to cite these new non-traditional objects. And we're start there's all been a lot of work over the last 12 to 18 months on data citations and principles around data citation. I think we're making really good progress on that. And it's a really important step along that route of saying the citation to the data set is just as important as the citation to the paper. It may be more important than the citation to the paper. But obviously we also want to capture the use of software and other things to make more data. So the things that may not involve the creation of a traditional journal article, or might not involve it yet, particularly if we want to encourage people to share these things earlier in the, in the process. So for that we also need to look at non-traditional measures. But what we should do in the first place is, is start to develop the notion of non-traditional measures of traditional outputs. So many of us, PLOS in particular, but many others as well, have worked on providing quantitative and non-quantitative measures of the performance of articles, uh, scholarly interest via bookmarks, public interest via downloads, use in Wikipedia. And many of these things we can now measure in a way that we couldn't before. And those enrich our understanding of how these papers are being used and who is using them which is a really important question that we've not been able to tackle before. And when we combine those two things together, when we have traditional measures of a richer set of research outputs and non-traditional measures of all of those outputs, then we'll have the web of measures and metrics and, and proxies that tell us something about how those are being used. And as we get more sophisticated in analysing that information, we'll have really interesting ways of saying this person's really great at creating data. Their data is really high quality and is really being used by a lot of people because of that quality. Or this particular person writes really great stuff that the public can really engage with and really understand. And once we can reward and encourage people to do what they're good at, rather than having everyone focus on this one kind of output with one kind of measure, I think we'll have a much richer and more diverse research community. And that's what will ultimately uh, create the environment in which uh, everyone can play the different roles that they're best at. How do you think uh, we have to wait, uh, uh, you know, so that these uh, tools are effective, effectively implemented and working. Uh. And working, uh, yes. Well, so William Gibson, as always, he says the future, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And I think that's, that's, that's very true. There are places and examples where these things are already making a difference. There are people who got academic jobs and postdocs on Twitter because they were already sharing their work online and they had that presence in that community. The Sloan and Moore Foundation um, have recently put a lot of money into a small number of 
what they're calling data science centres at, at US universities. And the money that they put on the table was enough to focus the attention of universities, whole universities, very sharply on what they could do to create a program that delivered on the objectives of real integration of data science into the overall way that the university worked. So where funders put money on the table and say these are the kinds of things that we're going to measure, institutions and researchers tend to follow. Now we've got work to do on the tools and the measures and I would be amongst the first to, to say that that's a really important thing that we shouldn't we shouldn't go from a world in which we get obsessed about one particular kind of number to another world where we get obsessed about some slightly different numbers. We should be scientists. We should be more sophisticated in our understanding of what these numbers actually mean, of what it is we want to measure. And that's the important question. The important question is less how do we build a tool that lets us measure stuff, but to really ask ourselves the question, what matters to us? that we want to measure it. We've spent a long time assessing what we were able to measure without and maybe losing track of what it was that was important about what we wanted to be able to say about research, about its quality, about its reach, about its impact. So we have to answer those questions first and then we do have technical work to build the models and the systems and to ensure the data is available to allow us to make the assessments that matter to different communities in different places in time. I think there's one other really core cool point. We made a mistake. The research community made a terrible mistake 30 or 40 years ago when they allowed, when we allowed, the information about citations to become the property of a single company. So we allowed the copyright system in the research publishing industry to take away the information that we created about what we use into a private space where we need to buy it back and where we can't get hold of that information. We need to make absolutely sure that the numbers, the measures, the proxies, all of those indicators that matter to us remain firmly under the control of the community so that as we change our understanding of what's important and how that moves, how that evolves over time, that we know we have the data at our fingertips to be able to do, make those assessments and make the changes to the systems that help us do those assessments. To maximize the reusability of research results, one has to be aware that there is no short-term motivation for this kind of action. I think that you would agree. And if so, many people may feel a little discouraged. So is there a need for a ethical revolution among the scientists to achieve the, the, the goals of openness or no? I think, I personally feel that we should be reassessing our ethical position around what research is, is for. Um, I've said it a number of times, I think we do need to seriously consider renegotiating the social contract for research and scholarship more broadly in the 21st century. Um, the current social contract was negotiated essentially in the aftermath of World War II and we haven't changed much about the way we think about the role of research since then in, in many ways. All of that said, I think there's a, there's a lot of power in thinking about how one creates short-term and long-term incentives. We have to recognise that the use of research often occurs in the medium to long-term and it should occur in the medium to long term. That's why we make it available and we archive it and we, we have proper indexing and systems in place to allow people to discover it over the long term. And we want to measure that in some way in the long term, but I think it also, in the shorter term, we can ask questions around the measures and the incentives we can create. And again, if we go back to this question of, can we measure the extent to which this is being used? And can we couple that directly to the assessment of research projects, research institutions and researchers themselves. Because if we do that, then the incentives align. Then the choice you make about how you construct and communicate your research will be driven by the understanding that I am going to be assessed on how much this is being used, therefore I need to make it usable and useful. Uh. Worldwide reuse of data. 
uh, is not only about goodwill of scientists and appropriate policies. It also depends on solid infrastructure, standardization of formats and metadata, uh, allowing the, 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 effective, the effective share. Mm, there are also possible discrepancies between approaches to the same data sets, uh, you know, within different disciplines interested in accessing it. Uh, what can be done to, to enable scientists with different backgrounds and different needs to, to effectively reuse uh, these assets? It's hard, and it's particularly hard to make it possible to reuse data across disciplinary boundaries. The, even with the best will in the world, with the best standards in the world, those standards and concepts of what the data sharing was for are bound up in the context in which the data is created. That makes it really challenging and potentially really expensive to make things available across disciplinary boundaries. At the same time, a lot of the excitement around big data arises from applying different approaches, different perspectives to data created across those disciplinary boundaries. So there's two aspects to this. Um, we absolutely need to do work on standards and systems and infrastructures that help us effectively store, discover, manage and mark up data. Um, that's a given. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there and, and organisations like CoData and the Research Data Alliance and others um, are actively working on, on those issues. The second set of issues are about collecting more of the context as it's created. And this is an area that's received less attention, but the idea that we can build better systems that mean we capture the context in which data is created, whether it's in the lab or in the field, at that point in time in a way that enables the kinds of uses that we haven't yet thought of. Um, there's a lot of potential there to solve some of the cost and efficiency problems by doing that early on. And then there's a third question, which is about the incentives to put the effort in to make data useful to yourself across those boundaries, and then to re-release that annotation, that, that markup, that additional metadata in a way that enables other people to then reuse it, that enables us to think about things not as a single publication event, but as a continual process of enriching this over time. So we talked a little bit earlier about data citation. That's important. But that concept of citation also has to be more sophisticated. We have to recognise both the original creators of data, perhaps the curators of that original data, but also people who have added value to that data over time so that they have the incentive, not just that they get to do the exciting research because they've put the work into making this data available, but that in the enrichment they've done can then serve other people, can perhaps make it easier for it to cross a new disciplinary divide. And we're some distance away from being able to do that in general. The people who do that successfully are already getting quite a lot of credit for doing amazing work, um, but we need to recognise the work involved in the data curation aspect of that to encourage that more widely. Um, and we need to think quite hard about what we mean by publication um, and because we too often see that as an end point now. It's, I've published it, it's over, I'm done. Rather than let me think about what I could do to add to this output, this paper, this data set, this software which will make it more useful. I've had this insight from another community that they might use it in this way. And if I make this change, or I add this documentation, I make that so much easier for them to do it. And maybe I don't even know yet that there is a use there, potentially. But there's, sorry, but there is the potential there. And that potential is enough for me to think it's worth the effort. Again, at the, at the end of the day, we need to think about how we communicate things in such a way that we are enabling the people who we haven't thought of, who we haven't met, who we've never heard of, to do things that we wouldn't have thought of. That underlies the whole point of doing research and communicating it. 
the point is to communicate it to people who can do the things we haven't yet thought of. Because if that wasn't the point, then we would never publish anything at all. Yeah. Uh, I think that another issue is uh, long-term storage and preservation of these vast amounts of data, uh, which requires long-term funding. And I'm just wondering who should be responsible for hosting the data so that they wouldn't vanish in, in I don't know, a decade or so? That's a really good question. It's a really important question. Um, at the moment, we don't have good international infrastructure funding arrangements. We don't tend to have very good national infrastructure funding arrangements. And that happens in two ways. One is that we tend to fund infrastructure through project grants and project funding. And that's a lot less than ideal. Um, because you're continually going from project to project rather than thinking about long-term sustainability. Um, there's another problem, which is that once something survives a certain amount of time, it becomes very hard to shut it down. And these things should have a lifetime. There should be a life cycle. Um, and that same should be true of, of data, ultimately. Um, a, a curator will often tell you that the secret of curation and archiving is choosing what to throw away. And making those choices is hard um, and requires expert knowledge, expert attention. Um, if we were to build the perfect infrastructure environment, um, it would have sustainable funding. It would be everyone would trust the strategic decision making about what to fund and what not to fund. Um, and it would cover the needs of the, of the whole community. And it would probably be international. Those are really difficult things to do in terms of funding instruments. Uh, there are a lot of people thinking hard about how best to do this in the longer term. The bottom line is there's actually plenty of money in the system to do this. Um, the Wellcome Trust and others have calculated that the cost of open access publishing is only around about 1.5% the total cost of the research funding that supports creation of the outputs that are then published. Um, that's actually less than what we currently pay in subscriptions. So we could take, if we move completely to an open access environment, we could take the leftover money, which could amount to anything up to about $10 billion a year. And we could use that to think about serious infrastructure funding for data and for the other outputs. And more things are going to come along the line. We'll have new communication infrastructures, new tools, new systems. Uh, we need to deal with those as well. So we, need to th we, we have money in the system. We need to figure out how to spend it. We need to figure out how to liberate it in the first place. Um, and then we need to decide how we're going to choose not to spend it sometimes. Because we, we're never going to have, have all the money we want to do all the things we want. There's always decisions to be made. And we don't yet have the frameworks to decide where to put limited resources in terms of that infrastructure at a level that, that works for what we need globally. Um, but I do believe we can work towards that. Uh, as far as digital data storage and preservation is, is concerned, I think there is also one uh, problem that, that we should address, mainly the, the uh, formats becoming obsolete. And how can we ensure the effective reuse of data after 20 or 30 years since they were produced? So the formatting of data for archiving is, is absolutely critical. Um, I hesitate to say it's a, lot, it's a solved problem, um, but I think we, we have enough experience in digital curation and preservation now to have an understanding of what works and what doesn't. What's absolutely crucial is open standard formats um, that are standardised where the, the, the format of the standard is open. So things like use text files, use TIFFs, uh, use HDF5 and provide the metadata that lets you interrogate those files, again in standard formats. Um, various XML formats are, are, are good examples of, of metadata standards. So we need um, to keep doing that work, um, but the good news is we know the principles which, which make this work, and it's open standards, open formats, 
um, and good preservation techniques um, and good choice of, t of formats for the future. Public Library of Science publishes seven open access journals. What's your data policy? Uh, is open data sharing obligatory? So it's interesting that you asked that question this <laughs> week. So we've just introduced a new um, data availability policy. What's interesting about that policy is that we haven't changed the nature of the data that's to be made available. So we've described the, the data that underlies the paper directly. So that's the data that you would need to reproduce the figures or the conclusions in the paper um, need to be made available. Now this was always the case. Authors had always agreed, and this is true of pretty much all reputable journals today, authors had already agreed for many years to make that available on request. We've changed that policy now so that on submission you need to do two things. You need to provide a data availability statement which will go in the paper and you need to explain where the data is available. Um, that can be in the paper itself, sometimes it's just a table. It can be in supplementary data, uh, Excel spreadsheets, sequence files, things that are not, not too huge. The preferred place is in an appropriate data repository, either a disciplinary repository like GenBank or the PDB, or in uh, a generic repository, either an institutional repository or something like Dryad or Figshare are both, both good examples. Um, but it can't be only available through the authors. It can't only be available by email. Now there's some important um, caveats on that. A lot of data potentially has issues with privacy or uh, concerns over release. Um, in those cases, what you need to do is explain how the data can be accessed through some sort of data access committee. Um, this is you know, standard pretty much for clinical uh, trial information now that there, there will be a, a data access committee that will assess whether someone is an appropriate person to release data to and under what conditions. But we recognise there are always going to be edge cases, there are always complicated cases. For instance, very large data sets of the terabyte size, um, or the stuff that comes off the Large Hadron Collider. There's nowhere to put that at the moment. So we need to deal with these things on a case-by-case -case basis. The important thing is that there's a data availability statement that says, if the data is available where it is, and if for whatever reason it's not available, explains how you can get access to it, um, and what the mechanisms for that to happen are. We could imagine, you know, in the long term, data availability policies from publishers um, will no doubt become stronger um, as the expectations of the community increase. What is clear at the moment is that currently different communities have very different expectations. And we need to work with those communities to understand where those boundaries lie um, and how we can encourage people towards better practice and more sharing over time. Uh, my final question, uh, scientists of the network era um, have to not only collect the data but also to manage and to search these, these data. Do you think that the uh, majority of scientists today uh, is already aware of this necessity or this completely different situation? I think it varies a lot. Um, both from discipline to discipline and from person to person. Um, the thing that might surprise you is I suspect that there is less difference with age than you might think. We often assume that a younger researcher is, is, is more connected to digital environments, is more up to date with technologies or systems for sharing, managing, processing data. Um, I think that's less true than people think it is. Um, it's certainly less true than the fact that there are big differences between scientific disciplines and the way they think about, handle and manage data. Um, there are people working in the computational sciences um, and particularly in bioinformatics who take data from experimental systems, put those into, into computational systems which are essentially entirely reproducible and, and you can actually completely rerun the paper from the data through to the actual new publication document in some cases. Um, and that's really exciting. And you have other disciplines where they're still arguing over whether they really ought to describe the way that they randomised the samples. 
um, when they do a statistical analysis. So there's a lot of variety. Um, I think there are, there are certainly people now who are aware of the challenges um, and who are thinking in that direction. Whether the incentives are in place to encourage them to really take that to its full extent, I think is, is debatable. Certainly it's not the case in some disciplines. Um, but as that changes, I expect we'll see a big change over time. Um, we also need to think about the skill sets, uh, whether the skills that young researchers learn today or learnt 10 years ago are the right ones for the future. Um, I know that's a concern for a lot of educators and, and a lot of governments. This issue of what's the best training to provide for the future. And we need again to focus on that question of incentives. You know, if we get the incentives right, then the rest more or less follows. Um, the, the researchers will tackle the problems that they think are interesting, as, as they always have. But they'll do that in ways that align with the systems that they work within. And if those systems encourage them towards reproducibility, high quality data management and high quality data collection, as well as communicating the results of those studies effectively, then we move towards a world where we're more effectively using the network communications infrastructure we now have available to us. Dr. Nalan, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Thank you. <laughs>